So uh, good morning, uh, Mr. JB, and good thank morning. you so much, sir, for granting us uh, the opportunity to interview sir here on uh, a portion of Nicolet Mountain mm -hmm. uh, in the Anlung Thom village, sir. And we are standing right here uh, in front of the community-based uh, center, yes, uh, which you know not just only the archaeological site, but also people uh, here with you know specialized guide, specialized specialized information. Uh, can take a tourist to explore the nature and also the archaeology of the mountain, sir. So, Mr. JB, uh, as you mentioned, you have been working in the archaeological site of the center since uh, the 2000, and you also uh, used to be uh, a member of the uh, EFEO school uh, based in Siem Reap, sir. Uh, sir, because when people, especially Cambodian people, talk about Kulit Mountain, they normally talk about the waterfall. They normally talk about Peter Ang Thom, you yes. know, the reclining Buddha and the pagoda. But um, proportionally, not many people talk about the temples or, you know, the other ancient structures that we rarely heard about. Mm -hmm. So for, let's say, for the past 25 years or so working on Kulit Mountain, sir, archaeologically, uh, what are the significant finding or maybe rediscovery that uh, you have so far, sir? So for the last uh, yeah, 25 years, uh, you're right, I've been coming here, working here, uh, first as a, as a, in, term, in, in the context of my personal university study. Mm -hmm. I was working in Angkor, but I was doing a master and then PhD. And after a few years, I was able to set up an organization called Archaeology and Development, ADF, um, specialized in Kulen and, and focusing in both uh, archaeological research and conservation and local development and environmental protection. So within these two co contexts in Prong Kulen, uh, I was able to first uh, check all the previous inventories mm -hmm. uh, before the, the, the Cambodian war. Uh, there has been some work done uh, from the late 19th centuries to the 30s 1930s, uh, mm. uh, but also in, in the 60s. Uh, these were mostly inventories of archaeological sites, uh, a few specialized stories, but not too much. Oh, you mean inventory like, uh, you know, like um, real life statue that they put somewhere or like information, paper, something like that? I mean uh, studies about sites uh, oh. that were located here, that are located here and inventories of sites, yeah, which mm. just list of sites at the very beginning, and then specialized uh, studies, mostly in the 30s, to um, research about the, the Kulen style, uh, which was mm. uh, integrated into the chronology of the, the Khmer styles. Yes, sir. Uh, and precisely between the pre, what we say, what we call the pre Angkorian and the Angkorian period. So this was particularly the case between 1936 and 1938 with a study uh, from Mr. Stern and Dupont. Later on in the 60s, there was Mr. Jean Boulbet, who was not an archeologist, but uh, an anthropologist and a botanist and studying the relation between uh, the population here and the nature mm -hmm. around. Uh, but he also published an archeological map. In this same period, there was also the discovery of Cabalspin archeological site, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a, river, a riverbed carved uh, in the other uh, peak in the other massif of Kulen. So, so, so when when was the let's say French um, scientific society first heard about Kabal Spin location? Sir? In 1968, this was the the oh. discovery uh, from uh, an, it was actually known from a, an hermit uh, called Tep May. He was uh, living in different location. He was moving quite a lot in Kulen, mm. but he knew that place and he informed uh, Mr. Boulbet about its. Uh, present and this is how the site was discovered. Um, this was in early 1968. There were some first uh, pictures, a registration of uh, and rubbing of ancient inscriptions. Mm. And of course, the civil war stopped all this dynamic. Uh, however, Mr. Boulbet was able to publish uh, an important book uh, called The Plomkulen and its region, yes, uh, studying, exposing, let's say, the relation between the, the villagers and their natural environment. And then nothing, nothing else. So when I came back in, when I came in 2000, first time in Kulen, uh, it was very remote, mm -hmm. uh, very hard to access to this village in particular. And um, the idea was to first see what has been done before and see mm -hmm. with my own eyes all these sites. 
to map them because we have better and more precise technology with GPS yes, at that right. time. So it was an opportunity to, to remap the sites and to see uh, uh, through this mapping uh, a kind of um, to determine some categories. We have temples, we yes, have sir. ancient rock shelters, we have dikes, we have ponds, and so on. So this was the first work that I did by myself. And then within the ADF uh, NGO, uh, started in 2008, we were able, with the collaboration with uh, Absara National Authority, to uh, excavate uh, some of these sites. Mm. Uh, so at first we focused on the uh, temples. Of course, we had to select Yes, sir. Because there is quite a few of them, and also the rock shelters. Um, so uh, the temples, we uh, select a few brick temples that are more secondary uh, temples, and we also select the pyramid temple at Rongchen, which is quite emblematic because it's the only pyramid temple in Kulen. We also, um, right at the beginning, uh, suspected the presence of a royal palace in mm. Kulen. But, 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 I mean, um how was the idea of a royal palace came into existence? Uh, because it, we know that yeah. in, in, in a Cambodian, in a Khmer capital, you have three major features, uh, mm. usually. Uh, you have the mountain temple, such as Angkor Wat for uh, the, uh, uh, the late Angkor Wat period, Bayonne or Prerup before and so on. Uh, we have uh, so mountain temple, royal palace, mm -hmm. and a large reservoir. These are usually the three main features that you find in a Khmer capital. Uh, mm. The following king usually either used the previous uh, uh, reservoir, but sometimes he creates another one. Yes, sir. So in this case, we were uh, kind of looking for these picture features. We knew that the, the pyramid temple was there. We had some. A suspicion about the existence of the royal palace, and we did find the royal palace uh, in mm. 2008 and 9. So we excavated this site for a few campaign. Uh, however, we didn't uh, we didn't know where was the Bahai, the ancient reservoir. So, so you discovered the temples, the like the pyramidal temples. No, it was it was known before. It was known okay. since the late 19th century. Oh. Uh, there was, as I said, there was a, a few inventories of these sites that were made very. Uh, uh, yeah, more than 100 years ago uh, by the French explorers uh, who, who made inventories about all the archaeological sites, yes, the temples in, in, ancient, uh, in the ancient Khmer uh, Empire and its territory. So we excavated those sites. We also excavated the later uh, rock shelters that have bas relief inscriptions, uh, sometimes traces of uh, wooden uh, architecture, mm -hmm. like post holes, or mm. holes for beams and so on. So uh, these sites uh, are quite numerous in Kulen and they yeah, catch our attention and we, we really wanted to date them more precisely. We knew they were a bit later because some inscriptions have dates from 11, 12, uh, 10 to, to 12 centuries. Uh, so we focused on these two kinds of sites, you know, temples, riot place, and, and also the later rock shelters. This was between 2008 and 2012. You mean the uh, rock shelters like cave, cave system or something uh, like that? So? They are not. Yeah, sometimes they are cave, they are cave but also. not very deep. Oh. Uh, sometimes they are just uh, natural arches, you know, uh, rock, yes, uh, yes, sir. rock arches. Uh, something like a shelter that people can. It's stay a natural under. shelter, yep. but yep. where people settled and and carved bas relief mm -hmm. and sometimes installed wood platform or wood walls and we can still see those, those traces of uh, wooden architecture. So this was really our interest, and it still is, but at that time it was really uh, focusing on these two kinds of, of sites to determine how was the mountain occupied from the early capital with mm -hmm. the mountain temple and the secondary temple from the 9th century to the later period with the rock shelters. Mm -hmm. So this was our, our first, uh, let's say, strategy in terms of archaeological research, to excavate not only the sites from the capital, but the, the ones that are also a bit later, such as the rock shelters. Yes, sir, but, but just a quick question, you know, because in Cambodian chronology, we often hear that, okay, the king uh, did like um, a Devraja cult yeah. on Mount Gulen around the 1800s something. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when the king was there, maybe Gulen was already inhabited. 
So do you think that Gulen was older than that? Do you have any you we, know, yeah, we, evidences, we, something like there's that? There's a few inscriptions that mention that Jarman II yes, yes. was uh, consecrated as a universal uh, ruler. king, yeah. ruler yeah. In, in Kulen and that he, he established the Devaraja mm -hmm. cult. Uh, this is quite a complex notion, um, god, king and so on. So uh, not going into the, these details, uh, we have to uh, base our assumptions on, on, on uh, inscriptions uh, right. and these are quite problematic because we have uh, actually we have no inscriptions from Jaraman II. There mm -hmm. are all the inscriptions that we know about him uh, in Kulen are, are, are later. Uh, mm -hmm. So they can, they can also be a bit twisted and, and, and Transformed along, all, uh, you know, along over the centuries, yes, because yes, obviously you it. interpret, you yes. uh, uh, kind of uh, make it nicer, you mm -hmm. idealize it. So uh, you have to take these inscriptions with cautions. However, they give a kind of large framework okay. for the career of Jarman II, who came from the eastern part of Cambodia towards mm -hmm. the Angkor region, and um, and at one point he came to Kulen. We have suspicion of uh, the existence of previous temples. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in particular, two of them are probably older than the capital in Kulen, mm. uh, but most of them date from this time. Um, and so does the mountain temple, and so does the Raya Palace. This is the result of our research. Uh, and then later on, you have the Hermit occupation, uh, which is from the 10 to the 12th. Uh, 13th century. So um, maybe this is not really about archaeology, but if you can answer that, sir, because you mean like hermit? You mean like those uh, who study religion, who study yes. maybe like, uh, if I can go a bit more, like they study like spell or something like that? In, they, in the what we know about these hermits uh, is that they usually are high-ranking people. Uh, oh. They know how to, to write and read the Sanskrit. Yes, um, but we don't know a lot about them. Well, they didn't leave any precise biography uh, for mm -hmm. sure, but they did left in some case uh, short text uh, written on the on the rock shelters, yes, uh, where they mentioned that they have been uh, they had a kind of prestigious occupation uh, before, and they mm -hmm. get away from that occupation. They re let's say they retired from the. From the world or from the court with the king and they they became a hermit mm -hmm. uh, to practice meditation this is one of the main occupation they practice meditation uh, and sometimes so, so they may not be buddhist but they also practice like they a, were not buddhist at that were. time they were mostly uh, Hind uh, hindu yeah. yeah so they because the barrelief that we have mm. in their rock shelters are in like a very meditation rarely, position something like that sir. yes we can see them uh, we can see some representation of hermit in, in meditation but we can also see the 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 the, the gods that are uh, illustrating illustrated in these in these uh, shelters mm. are mostly related to Hinduism, uh, Shiva in the shape of Shiva, yes, uh, Sadashiva, or uh, it's, it's quite rare to see a Buddhism image at that time. It's, in a few cases there is, but uh, most of the time it's, it's related to Hinduism um, in, in the form of Shiva or Vishnu. Um, so we were also quite interested into this, uh, these sites because these are very unusual and very particular and also very beautiful sites. Never studied in, in the Khmer uh, archaeology, the Khmer world. So we were the first to excavate two of them and recently a third one. Um, so that gave us the confirmation that these sites were firstly occupied during, from the 10th to the 13th centuries. They're usually settled in the in this in the sides of the, the Phnom on the cliff where you have mm. natural rocks yes, sir. Uh, shelter or arches uh, and also that gave us the, the, the confirmation that these sites are occupied not only by one hermit at the beginning maybe there was one hermit who mm. retired from the world but then there's a whole community that comes and leaves maybe comes back and leaves. It's not the permanent occupation of a uh, lot of people. It could be temporary uh, visitors yes, that sir. comes to learn uh, meditation. We can assume that because we see 
the traces of very large building in some mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. uh, that are obviously not built by only one person for one person. Uh, it's it, these are sometimes 500 square meters, so they are very big mm. buildings that we can see through the post holes in the sandstone rock. Yes, sir. Uh, and these sites uh, obviously probably start with the lone uh, ermit, mm. but then became popular and welcome some pilgrims, some people who came yes. to give offer, such as a pedestal or an alinga, or to learn. Uh, the, the teaching from meditation. It's actually not very different from the practice of the hermits that we still see today in Kulen. We have some hermits or you, some so monks. still hermits yes. here in Kulen? So. Yes, there are still hermits and monks that are uh, practicing meditation in a temporary uh, place. Shelters, short, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they don't stay all over the year, they move. Uh, they are quite uh, hard to catch and to, <laughs> to see these people. Uh, oh, quite discreet, okay. of course, uh, but they sometimes attract some local villagers to bring some food, to bring some mm. offering, and so on. So this is the tradition of hermits and, and uh, associated pilgrims in Kulen is, is actually over a thousand years old. Uh, if you so the hermits are Cambodian people. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. So after these uh, studies of temples related to the capital from the 9th century mm -hmm. and, and the rock shelter a bit later. We also were able to uh, participate to the LIDAR uh, consortium that yes, was sir. set up by my colleague uh, Damien Evans at that time from the University of Sydney. And we joined forces with uh, seven other uh, archaeological oh. team, including the Ministry of Culture and Absent Authority to uh, apply this technology of LIDAR over mm -hmm. uh, first three areas in 2012, Kulen, Angkor uh, and Coquer, and in 2015 in, in a much, in, in basically a lot of archaeological sites uh, in the whole Cambodia, up to Bante Chma or Sambal Pekuk. But in 2012 mm -hmm. and 2015, we had two areas covered, uh, two yes, times so. in, in Kulen. And this is where the big surprise came because uh, not only we could clearly see the temples that we knew with their uh, platform uh, or the dikes that we knew, uh, but we could see a whole network of a uh, urban network that was defining a grid very precisely uh, organized. Mm. Uh, so this grid, this grid is made of uh, uh, earthen dikes. Yes, uh, earthen, raised dike. Earthen dike. Yeah. yeah. Raised so not, dike. not like left, right wall. No. No, they are just earth. You know, just soil mm -hmm. uh, raised in, in a line. So it's a dike, mm -hmm. um, and this is very organized. You, you have it's covering 40 to 50 square kilometers. So it's a huge area. Mm. Uh, it's divided into squares. So they could be a rice field, no? So Maybe. this we, was obviously the questions because uh, yes, we knew where the people pray. We knew where the king was staying, the royal palace, but we didn't know where the people were grow staying. Food. Yeah, grow yeah. food and lived. So um, this urban grid was, uh, it's, you have to imagine, it's quite a large uh, scale. It's, it's a, it's, each block is mm. 1.5 uh, kilometer. It's a square of 1.5 kilometer side, and you have three of them east-west and at least four north-south. So it's a huge rectangular uh, area. Uh, divided into these squares, and Just within so. these squares, you have other division of small plots where probably people lived and maybe cultivated uh, their rice. We didn't see any traces of uh, uh, crops, or crops or, exactly, yep. of you know dikes around mm -hmm. the, the rice fields as we see in the Angkor Plains. So we suspect the population were either getting the food. Uh, from, from below, from, below, from yes, the plain, yes, from or they were practicing slash and burn agriculture, mm. like they used to do until very recently here. So this is not, this is still not uh, sure yet, but this is yeah needs to be confirmed by by further research. But this was the major rediscovery in 2015, uh, 12, first and 15, uh, to find that the sites that we knew mm -hmm. uh, were all linked into uh, a urban network which is very ambitious, uh, very large, uh, probably unfinished, mm -hmm. uh, and 
showing that all these known sites were not randomly uh, built uh, on the top of the plateau, but within the grid, uh, very organized, and which is quite surprising because the top of Kulian Plateau is not flat. Uh, it's a succession of of uh, high points, valleys, uh, lower Make, points. Making settlement even harder to Exactly. To, to Whereas in Encore, everything is flat. Mm -hmm. You can go straight, you know, orientate your, your dike, your channel, and so on. Here, it's not the case. And despite that, despite the, the, the and even uh, topography, they managed to, to, to do a very orientated and, and regularly organized uh, urban grid. So that was... That was quite a discovery. Yes, sir, but uh, you know, because Gulen Mountain is very big, of course. I mean, looking from the National Road 6, we saw a very long mm -hmm. range. Um, I suppose maybe more than 20, uh, 20 kilometers in length, something so like that. So it's actually uh, 15, if, I, if I'm recall it well, it's actually uh, 15. Um, it's oriented towards southwest and northeast. Yes. Um, sorry, northwest and southeast. So uh, it's about 25 for the Kulen Plateau in itself mm -hmm. uh, length, and uh, 20 or 15 in in, in yes. the other direction. Yes, sir. However, this is only the, on the what we call the Kulen Plateau. Oh, uh, yeah, but, but the, the chain, surrounding the... The, the, there is another another range mm -hmm. of mountain that continues uh, further to the north uh, west with there is no generic name for that for that ranch mm -hmm. however it's still inside the national park of Kulen mm. and the first one and the most famous is Kabalspin Phnom Kabalspin uh, every higher point of this second range has a different name it doesn't have a generic name as a Kulen plateau located to the southwest so but, but what is uh, like the big. highest peak um, that so you can... it's the highest peak of Montaigne is 496 meter uh, this so will not, not too high not no it's not very high it's not, not very, very high. high however uh, it's quite different from the plain uh, mm -hmm. and it it forms a natural fortress because you have mm. the plain around and then the slope and then the cliff that's the the usual profile of Kulen so uh, this can be also helpful to to be uh, protected if you have uh, political issues if mm. you are a king. So this could be a reason why German II settled here. This is just an hypothesis. More like a strong point. Something exactly, like, like a yes, fortress, yes. a fortress. natural fortress. fortress. Actually, the Khmer Rouge did use that place as well since, mm. 2000, uh, since uh, 1971. It was already a strong hold uh, for the Khmer Rouge until 97. So um, it's easier if you can settle in this area because you can uh, first, you can hide in the forest, in the cave, but also you can uh, defend yourself better from a higher point. So this was used uh, uh, in the 70s and 80s as well. Uh, yes, but sir. most of the Kulen Plateau uh, and the capital is within the south part of the Kulen Plateau. The northern part is, was not occupied because we, we can certify this uh, with the LIDAR. Mm -hmm. Now there's no traces of human occupation. Um, and it's still not the case, it's still forested, whereas the south part where we are now, it's uh, where you find the villages, but that's also where you find uh, the ancient capital. So, so you mentioned that what we, are, we are standing here is more or less the center of the capital. Exactly. We are based on what, sir, like orientation uh, of each temple that you can... The yeah. center, it's, it's, we could say there is two, two centers, one could be more uh, the civil center with mm -hmm. the royal palace, um, and the, we can also say that there was more a religious center with the mountain temple, Rongchen, mm. Prasad uh, Rongchen. So these these two sites are obviously very important. They actually defined uh, the orientation and the organization of this grid that I was mentioning before. Yes, sir. Um, and here at the moment we are located just a bit uh, towards the east of uh, these sites. But very close, uh, Aram Rongchen is, is about two kilometers from here. Yes, sir. Um, again, sir, because, uh, you know, we, when we say Gulen Mountain, we often, you know, refer to a specific period of time, maybe like the peak of the civilization or something like that. But again, like you mentioned, you know, it could be even before the, eight, the you know, the 800 years mm -hmm. when the king did the, you know, the, 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 the cold the or something. Yeah. So, you know, from that until today, 
it's more than a thousand years. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, from from the research that many researchers did during the 1960s uh, or even earlier than that, and until today, sir, um, just like a general view, sir, like how much do you actually know about Gulen Mountain? Is it like a mountain full of a mystery, archaeologically, or maybe you have maybe perhaps? Well, I think. Okay. Uh, First, just to, to, to precise a little bit, uh, um, you know, the definition between pre onkorian and Orkorian period yes. is, very, uh, is very practical. It's, it's something that the historian and archaeologist, mm. uh, the French archaeologist, have defined of before the, the, the war and that it is still used and, uh, nowadays. However, it's a bit of an uh, artificial uh, separation. Uh, yes, sir. So, for sure, German II, who founded this capital uh, in the early 9th century in Kulen. And that marked the beginning of the Anko uh, period, something yes, like that. Yes, exactly. However, um, if you go to Sambor Precook, you will see a site which is massive with a lot of temple. Uh, which means that there was a central power that was also very powerful. Mm. Um, but the central power from the 7th century collapsed during the, se- the 8th century mm-hmm. uh, yes. and, and get back to, to some strength with Yarm II uh, around the, the beginning of the 9th century. So um, <clears throat> it's just a question of how strong is the king mm-hmm. and how can he you know, uh, uh, organize uh, all the, the, the provinces around him uh, to keep a strong power. So we usually, it's a bit of a caricature to say that Shaman II is the founder of the Khmer Empire. Yes, sir. I would rather say that it's in the continuity of what happened before yes. uh, and Sambor Prekuk is a good example mm-hmm. of how a strong uh, political state can, can create a, a large and, and uh, capital with many uh, archaeological sites, uh, many temples and and reservoirs. However, <coughs> the situation can evolve, mm-hmm. uh, the political power can collapse, and this is what happened after Sambor Precook. So, uh, it, it, it's just not coming out of nowhere, Germany II, you know, it's a tradition of uh, what happened before. Um, so, all this um, story about German II, founder of the Khmer Empire, with the Devaraja cult and so on, yes, sir. kind of create a bit of a legend around his person, mm-hmm. and especially around Kulen, where we knew from inscription that he settled this, this capital. We didn't know really what happened here until we uh, gathered the previous research. Uh, some of them were clearly indicated that there was a capital. This, mm-hmm. this is known since 1911, actually, that the mm-hmm. the, compu- the, the, the Mahendra Parvata, the capital of Charman II, was established in Kuled. It was confirmed in 1936-38 with an archaeological... So properly recorded in the early 1900s? Uh, uh, in the early 20th century, yeah. 20th century, And yeah. then confirmed uh, with some archaeological research in mm-hmm. 1936. But these research were only focusing on, on uh, temples, mm-hmm. and in particular uh, the lintels, the columns, and the sculptures that were inside these temples. Uh, it was important research to determine the Kulen style. However, it was very orientated toward art history. Um, yes, sir. After that, not much until, yeah, we, we came and we were able to excavate quite a few number of sites, 22 if I recall well, um, selecting from these um, temples, mountain temples, Raya Palace, uh, rock, later rock shelters, and then when we had the LiDAR results mm-hmm. uh, in 2012 and, and the next season, we were obviously s- changing a bit our strategy and focusing on these sites, on the sites that were revealed by the LiDAR, which mm-hmm. are usually uh, not visible if you don't know that they are archaeological sites. It's just a bump or uh, a depression, a hole. But if you see the LiDAR data, you can clearly see that these are mounts, artificial mounts, human-made mounts, or earthen dikes, or ponds, or platforms, and they are covered by, by vegetation. So this is the advantage of the LiDAR, is to give yes, you... Uh, to, 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 to pierce through the, the, the forest the, exactly. to see what, what to is... To see uh, the topography, yeah. to have a very precise uh, 
3D model of the of the ground topography. And mm. uh, so we focused from 2013 to these sites, excavating often dikes, platforms, mound fields, uh, dikes, and, and so on. But do you discover like new temples or something like that, or normally you know like um, the architecture that 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 you know that is harder to see without lidar normally? Uh, your discovery did, for the yes, last the lidar years. showed us a few temples that were not known before. However, all these temples are obviously not massive brick mm, towers lost like, in the forest. So they, they the remain the foundation only something like exactly. This, uh, these are usually uh, the ma the main towers or even the pile of brick in the forest are known mm. from the villager. The villager go everywhere, mm. uh, they know quite a lot, and I have been following yeah. a couple of them to do the mapping of these sites yes, before the LiDAR. Uh, however, some features that are quite hard to see because of the forest cover, mm. they didn't know them, and, so, and, and, and I didn't either. So this was you know, the discovery of the LiDAR, and they were not uh, high temple, uh, they were just platform or non-finished temple or maybe temple be built of, of uh, perishable material. We know that... Yes, like woods or exactly. thatched so, house, something yeah, like that. Yeah. So. so this was uh, discoveries, but not spectacular architectural mm. discovery. The, the most spectacular discovery with the LiDAR was the whole uh, network of this, mm. uh, uh, this whole urbanization system that was uh, set up in, in the Kulen Plateau. Yes, sir. But, you know, you mentioned that just now, you know, the, the discovery is not that large, maybe because of the terrain that makes construction of large monument a bit hard, not like, you know, Machu Picchu or maybe mm. not like the Great Wall of China, something like that, sir. But again, you know, it is often said that the Gulen Mountain is the water source of uh, the Angkorian, uh, you know, city back at the flatland mm -hmm. between the Tunle Saab Lake and the Mount Gulen. So, before we get to the water, sir, um, by studying Mount Gulen, do you think that the information here can help shine other lights on, you know, the, the Angkor City at the um, flatland, sir? Yes, of course. Um, in, in different, in different uh, ways. First, uh, if you know better the capital in Kulen, mm -hmm. you know better how the temples were built. Well, we know we knew that uh, before. You yes, know, these, these are usually single brick tower mm -hmm. uh, today lost in in the forest, but at that time in a probably open uh, field or open area. Um, what is quite surprising is the, the urban network where they are integrated into, uh, mm -hmm. and this, if you compare this network, this urban grid, to what happened in Sobok Prekup before or what happened later during the Angkorian period uh, and notably in Angkor, you can see that there is an evolution of the Khmer uh, urbanism. The like way city design. You exactly. Mean, city uh, design. Again, uh, this design, this urbanism can, can change along the centuries. Mm -hmm. However, there is things that really never changed. It's the Raya Palace the mountain temple mm. and the Baha'i. So um, it's a bit of a caricature, a bit of a shortcut, but this is features that we find uh, all over uh, pre-Ankorian and Ankorian period. So uh, it's in always interesting to compare the urbanism uh, before and after with the one in, in, in Kulen. Yes, sir. But again, mentioning about LIDA, because before LIDA, maybe you have to go through the forest? Well, after, you know, to yeah. pin the grid one by yes. one and to do like Trigonometry, Before the like LiDAR, that, yeah. uh, I was relying on the existing map from my uh, previous uh, yeah. colleagues. I yeah. mean, the, my colleagues from the late 19th century, early uh, 20th century, 1930s and 1960s. There was a couple of maps that were quite well done for, mm. for that time. Yes, sir. However, uh, these, uh, uh, these colleagues didn't benefit from satellite technology, yeah. GPS and so on. So my my first work was to uh, remap, uh, to redo the mapping with just a simple GPS mm -hmm. um, by going to all the sites that were already mapped previously. Yeah. And pinpoint them together. Yeah, to and get, then yeah. I was not able to do that alone. I, 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 I was uh, very much helped by the villagers, and in particular two or three of them that knew very well 
uh, from the main tower in the forest to a brick a pile of brick uh, uh, isolated, they were able to, to take me there. So this was the real first job of, of mapping. Once we apply the LANAR technology, you actually have uh, a very precise 3D model of uh, the topography, a uh, digital model of the, of the terrain. Yes, sir. So this is very helpful, but it's on your computer in the office. So you need mm -hmm. to download this data to a GPS and go back to the field to check the features, to check the dikes, to check the mounts, to check the ponds. So what you mean is that we may understand that, okay, the structure is something man-made in the forest, but we cannot, you cannot, see, you cannot confirm it, using uh, the, you, the file alone, no? Uh, basically, the, f the, 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 the feature that you walked over, yes, sir. if it's covered by vegetation, dense vegetation, or even high grass, uh, you don't, you cannot really perceive, you cannot really see it mm -hmm. because of the vegetation. And therefore, you cannot really see if it's natural or, or man-made. In the Encore Plain, this is quite, this is more obvious because everything that is raised has a chance to be man-made uh, because you have to raise yourself from the flooded water, flooded rice fields in, yes, in the rainy season. So any platform you know, in the Encore landscape is usually man-made, maybe recently, but also at the Encorean period. So in the context, in the topographical context such as Kulen, you cannot really uh, have the same uh, vision uh, mm -hmm. because everything is, you know, high point, low point, and everything is more or less covered by vegetation. So mm -hmm. this is where the LiDAR is a great tool because it's virtually deforest uh, everything and you can have a very precise um, uh, map of the ground. And therefore after you can go back to the field and check that the feature you've been crossing many times over many years is actually uh, a dike that is uh, several hundred meters long, mm. or the bump you've been driving over for many years is actually part of a, a series of uh, mounts that was previously not known. So this was the, 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 the great discovery and the main advantage of the LiDAR technology. Yes, sir. But, you know, looking from the map that you put in your research paper from my, you know, untrained eyes, I see that, you know, the temple, one temple is over here, another temple is over there. Mm -hmm. um, so, a bit different from, you know, let's say maybe Kokke, a bit different from Onko region. So, the city in Kulen, is it like centralized in a way that it is easy to perceive or it's more like, you know, an uh, organic development that happens, you know, here and there? I would say it's quite centralized. Mm -hmm. In it's not that different from, from Encore uh, or Coquer. You still it, see the axis uh, yes, connecting together. The, the yeah. thing is that Encore is, is, uh, has been used and built and reused and modified for mm -hmm. over five even more, but let's say from, from the 9th to the, to the 15th centuries. Yes, so uh, it's harder to read as a as a whole because it's a super imposition or mm. juxtaposition of capitals. Yes, sir. Uh, with mountain temple, with reservoir, with many, you know, secondary or very large temple, as we know. Uh, here, it's a one-shot capital, okay? It's like Kake, let's say, similar to Kake, yes, yeah, one-shot capital. Yes, in a way. So, uh, this is a very ambitious plan. It's covering mm. a, a large area, 40 to 50 square kilometer, with two main sites, three main sites, yeah. Uh, uh, mountain Temple, Raya Palace and Reservoir, and, and then a grid of dikes defining that whole area. And within this grid, we can see clearly the link of the secondary uh, temples. Uh, so it's, a, it's like a, an organization quite well thought, especially mm -hmm. in this um, irregular topography. Uh, but the mo let's say one point quite important is that it's a, it hasn't been reused after. And it's also mm. probably unfinished because the Bahai in Kulen is unfinished. We can clearly see that it was started, but never finished. The yes, mountain sir. temple as well, it's not finished. Um, it's quite common that the Khmer temple were not finished, but in this case, uh, the, 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 the sites were not completed uh, uh, to, their, to their termination, you know. Uh, so 
there is a, the coolant capital, Mahendra Parverta, as, as we know its name from the description, is a clear and very ambitious program, however not uh, finished to the, to the original plan. Yes, sir. So focusing a bit on nature, sir, because um, of course um, there's no record from maybe the Angkorian period or maybe before that or after that. But, uh, you know, in a span of a thousand years, maybe nature has <coughs> changed yes. quite much, sir. So do you think uh, the ecosystem during the Angkor time and today on Mount Kulin is very different? Or, um, you know, actually, nature is we, basically the same, sir? We have ways to, to know how it was at that time by doing corings in the humid areas. <coughs> Sorry, you mean so like uh, drilling, uh, drilling the samples sediment. exactly oh, okay, samples okay. of soils because yes, these samples of soils they catch uh, uh, pollens uh, and charcoals. Uh, mm -hmm. When you have a swamp, you have a vegetation uh, with with pollens. You have yeah some samples of charcoal falling. And you mean pollen, pollen like yeah. uh, the small the yes. small thing from the flowers exactly. Okay, so okay. Or, or even seeds that are. Uh, preserved in in humid mm. context. If it's humid, and if it stays humid in a tropical context, you can preserve these uh, these um, plant parts. plants. Yeah. So uh, we have been participating uh, to studies uh, from corals that we mm -hmm. uh, selected uh, in in the humid uh, places in in ponds, and we had a list, for example, of of uh, plants that were um, developing at the time, also some charbon, charbon, uh, carbon uh, dating, uh, thanks to charcoal. Mm -hmm. So we have a rough idea of the uh, environment at that time. Um, we can see, for example, from one, one of the charcoal that the plants uh, until the 10th century, if I remember well, uh, were typical of plants that are not present in a forest, which means it was quite deforested at that time, oh, which is normal. Okay. If you make a yeah. capital, you need to... You need wood. Uh, yeah, you need, you need wood, to, you need to, to build. Exactly, yes. you need, to, you need mm. to establish this urban grid and you need to deforest. So we have uh, some idea of that, yeah, this was quite deforested at that time, mm -hmm. uh, at least partially, where we did took the sample. Uh, however, there is a shift at one point where it becomes uh, more abundant because mm. other plants are growing. So uh, uh, there is uh, indication about, you know, before, uh, during this capital and after. Yes, sir. And also because, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, Kulin Mountain, you know, what Cambodian people believe, or maybe it is also a scientific, you know, technical information. Kulin Mountain is the source of water mm -hmm. for the Onko you know, the entire Onko city, mm -hmm. sir. So we have a lot of uh, reservoirs and mm -hmm. also canals. But, you know, again, when the French came, you know, to do research very early in the days, you know, Nippon Reservoir was dried out. Uh, time, the, yeah. east, mm -hmm. the East uh, Reservoir, mm -hmm. West uh, East Mebon was dried out. Mm -hmm. Lolei Reservoir was maybe dried out, so maybe, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that there is a decrease in water distribution from Kulit Mountain? That is why uh, it's, hard to it's hard to say. It's so. hard to say because we don't have data of how much uh, the water flow mm. uh, was important at that time. We don't have data about the rainfall. Uh, however, what we know from the archaeological evidence, from the archaeological sites, is that uh, during the capital, so early 9th century, there is a uh, a system of dikes. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I was mentioning the earthen dikes defining yes, the grid, but these earthen dikes are integrating dams. Uh, we knew about these dams because... So uh, dikes are different from dams, yes, from, from your technical Yes, because dams are blocking water. Okay, oh, dams is okay. like a it's a, it's a it's a much bigger feature. More permanent features. Mm, yes, yeah. and also larger and longer and higher. Okay. Uh, and it's built in a valley. Oh. So if you build this dam in uh, perpendicular to a valley, you block the water, right? Mm, and you yes, create a reservoir, which has usually a triangular shape in, in this context. Mm. Um, 
so these dikes were known uh, prior to the LiDAR, but now we can clearly see that they are integrated within the grid of earthen dikes. Yes, sir. Uh, these dams, sorry. So um, we knew that during the uh, capital of German II, there was this reservoir probably to uh, maintain some water. Some water for agri yeah. uh, agriculture, agriculture, something like that. Uh, we can also imagine they constitute a reservoir for fish. So mm. a good uh, a, okay. a good way to, to have yep, yeah. uh, uh, to assure like a pond, food like, security, yeah. Also, <laughs> yeah. you know, oh. uh, because going down to the plain is quite a long way and so mm. on. So um, we knew that there was hydrological feature from the uh, 9th century. However, uh, we don't have the scientific data of how much it was raining, how much water flow was coming and so on. So uh, what we know now is that these features uh, are still regulating uh, the water flow from the Siem Reap River. Mm. They can be blocked, they can be restored. Uh, uh, Sarah Authority actually restored one of them a few years back and they are still used by the villagers uh, today. Mm. Uh, the reservoirs are still uh, They're still captured. working yeah, more or less. For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The water from from uh, this village a long time is partially coming from uh, yes, from uh, the reservoir behind the pagoda. So um, the link between the, the, the water flow uh, at that time yeah. and the water flow in Encore, we don't have the data we don't have for that. a lot of information. However, confirm, we so. know that the river, mm -hmm. the Siem Reap River, takes its birthplace in Kulen Plateau, and this hasn't changed since the Encorean period. Uh, it's not only one river, it's many, many rivers yes. joining and then becoming one river. Uh, but it's not only the only, the, it's not the only one, you have the, the Pook River and uh, the oh, no, no, no. Holios yeah. River. Yeah. So, Rolou, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so this, but, but judging from the amount of reservoir and the size back then, maybe we can say that, oh, the, the, the water was big, maybe. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, again, we have these dams blocking yes, valleys and creating large reservoirs. I think we have five, four to five big of, uh, you know, yes, uh, which creates a large amount of water. And if you include the, the Barai, mm -hmm. which was unfinished, as I said, uh, this would have made a very large uh, uh, amount of water. The Barai, mm. uh, between, uh, to, located to the east of the mountain temple in Kulen, um, is about one kilometer long and more than 200 uh, meter uh, wide. So it, yes, it would have been a very large reservoir. However, it was never finished. Yes, sir. And also a bit of a question on uh, conservation. So because um, in Simri, uh, sorry, in Angkor region now, there are many conservation uh, process yeah. for a very long time already. Um, mm. But how about the ancient monument on Kulin, sir? So Most of them, they are, are they in urgently needed uh, conservation effort? So there is a, there is a bit of, a, of a history on this. Yes, uh, we, we gathered all, with our, our team of archaeologists, we gathered all the previous information that was uh, con uh, yeah, concerning Kulin sites. Uh, so we know more or less what happened in terms of conservation uh, from the 30s. Again, it's always the same period, huh? 30s, 60s, because there was archaeological research at that time. Um, and then when we started our excavation in, in the 2008, we were able to make some uh, very uh, urgent uh, supporting structure uh, together with Apsara Authority. Now that Apsara uh, is uh, developing more uh, resource um, and has a, a better uh, trained uh, team, uh, they can implement their own uh, restoration mm. uh, project. And uh, they have been doing quite a few in, in Kulen, uh, Prasad yes, Kahom. Uh, they are doing at the moment Prasad uh, Aung. So these are large monuments that are threatening uh, by nature yeah by, by nature. because you know they yes, they, they, they these are fragile monuments brick yes. monuments so you always have risk of uh, collapse and so on so they they are uh, implementing restoration project on these sites if they cannot make a uh, restoration project because it requires quite a lot of resource uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, what they do is that they do supporting structure. Yes, sir. Like temporary, uh, temporary stopper, fixing. Well, that's yes. it, yeah. Yes, sir. But, okay, uh, also the last question about conservation, sir. Um, because Gulen has a lot of uh, sculpture or maybe carving near the water or under the water, something like that, sir. Especially with the Thousand Lingam mm -hmm. uh, area. Mm -hmm. So, do you think uh, structures like that, especially under the water, are they, you know, compared to the structure above land, you know, that faces the air, are they more prone to deterioration than the one above land? Or if they stay under the water for so long, they don't catch any air, so they, they stay longer? So. It, it really depends because you can, <laughs> sure, being under the water, especially a water that is moving, a river, a river. Yeah. Uh, you get this, the sediment, the exactly, rocks, something You have like erosion. That. Uh, erosion. Erosion with sand. Uh, actually, we have been mapping very precisely both Cabal Spin and the 1000 Linga. Mm -hmm. So we yes, have sir. a very detailed map of these two sites. I hope we can make signboards and publication on signboards for the visitors uh, in the coming year. Uh, and this mapping has shown the traces of erosion uh, with the sand. Uh, mm -hmm. against the, the each linga, you can see clearly uh, traces of erosion. Uh, sure, it's it's an issue, uh, but if you can, if you consider that they date back from the 10th to 12th century, uh, they have here. been they have <laughs> been eroded, but they are still here exactly. Yeah. Uh, to the uh, opposite, we can you you have uh, bas relief lintels of mm -hmm. temple that were left in the temples. Uh, and that have been looted, that have been, you know, damaged and so on. Yes. So it's not only because you are under water that you are more uh, susceptible to susceptible damage. To no. damage. Yeah, yeah, everything it, can happen, yeah. Yes, sir. But <laughs> again, so like one, do you know, maybe, do you have any, you know, like wandering, like idea, like how did they carve yes, that we, underwater? Do we, you, do we, you? We, have a, we have an idea because we have been mapping them and we mm. find small holes that are used that are not very visible when you look at the linga, but that are used as a as a key point of a reference to duplicate a series of uh, of linga. So, for example, mm. you have a, a square full of linga with the small yeah. points in the corner, a small hole, and then uh, at the exact location you have uh, an equidistance. You have yes. the same points and the same amount of linga. But, so but they, like when when they carve the, the so image, the, maybe they they stop the water. Exactly. Or that, that's like the that. main thing. Yeah. Before they start carving, they have to block the water, oh, otherwise okay. it's impossible to carve in the water. Yes, so we suspect they carved into the, during the dry season, mm. where the water is much it's lower, lower yeah. okay. otherwise it's impossible. And how do they block the water? Probably with, with small, small dam. dams, with yeah. boards and sand and stones, and we have no mm. documentation or archaeological uh, evidence of that, but we know that it's impossible to, to carve into uh, the, water. Uh, the water, so they probably block one part of the riverbed to let the river go on one side and mm -hmm. then probably do the other side. Yes, sir.